Hello, everyone, and welcome to session two of the day. It's a beautiful, wonderful day out there, and we're glad to have you here. My name is Nora Kane, and I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library. If you haven't already, I hope you'll get a chance to visit our table along with all the other interesting exhibits in the pavilion today. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this really intriguing and wonderful community dialogue. Dr. Laura Roberts holds the Catherine Dexter McCormick and Stanley McCormick Memorial Professorship in Medicine. She is the Chief of Psychiatry Service at the Stanford Hospitals and Clinics and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Joining Dr. Roberts is Stephen Adelsheim, the Director of Community Partnerships within the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He is a child and adult psychiatrist whose work focuses on support for community behavioral health partnerships. Keith Humphreys is a professor and the section director for mental health policy in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. His research focuses on the prevention and treatment of addictive disorders and formation of public policy. Anna Lemke is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences whose work focuses on enhancing addiction services in primary care settings. She is also interested in health services research in co-occurring mood and substance abuse disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberts, Dr. Adelsheim, Keith Humphreys, and Anna Lemke. Before we start, though, I'd like to just say how we're this, this morning will proceed. Um, each of the presenters will make some comments, and then at, after that, uh, We'll start a community dialogue and there'll be questions and answers of, uh, for you. Just so you also know, I've been told to tell you that this program is being recorded. So you might want to keep that in mind as you um, talk about the questions that you have as you formulate them. Thank you all. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for giving your Saturday to Stanford and also to this particular topic, which is uh, a subject of, I think, great concern, um, our own well-being, our mental health, our resilience in the face of, of hardship, even the word resilience suggests that there's something you need to be resilient in response to. And um, we're really interested in talking with you. I have the privilege of working with my wonderful, wonderful colleagues who are here. And we thought we'd make a few comments, just as was mentioned, about the topic, about the importance of the topic, maybe a few different perspectives on, um, on this issue of mental health and well-being. And, but mostly we'd love to hear from you and to respond to whatever questions um, you may have. So please have that in the back of your mind um, that we'll spend a goodly portion of our time talking with you directly. So um, we conceptualize this time as thinking about um, living your best life. All of us wish to have um, the aspirations of our life fulfilled, a life of purpose, of joy, that you wake up each day and the sense of meaning and the ability to progress through the day with that meaning with your partner. Um, but there's also implicit in that the fact that there's a lot of adversity, that there are many hardships that often go unspoken, unrecognized, even between loved ones. Um, and this is really a, a significant issue in our society. Um, in fact, one in five of us lives with mental illness. I'm going to say it again. One in five of us lives with mental illness. That means that every single one of us will certainly uh, potentially be vulnerable at some point in our lives because of an extraordinary event that may occur to us. Um, our biological predisposition combined with life experience may make us vulnerable to these things. But also, even if we ourselves are happy and fortunate to kind of dodge that bullet, we will love someone. We will work with someone. We will give birth to someone. We will um, have a parent who is um, struggling with the hardships of mental illness. And so always appreciating that this is a, a part of life, it's part of the human condition, um, and having a sense that we should aspire for as much as we can, but also be mindful of the hardships that we, um, we may inevitably um, encounter. And I want to put an accent on this because it really relates to something important throughout the world. Um, if one in five of us um, lives with mental illness, and um, half of the people who present to their doctor have actually an underlying mental health or addiction disorder that leads to the, um, that encounter with that doctor that day, and it's not spoken, it's not recognized, then it will never really be adequately treated. And so every individual 
every family, every community, every nation throughout the world is deeply affected by this. And you can see it from the perspective of the workplace, where we lose productive years of work from wonderful employees, wonderful workers. Um, and it ha then has economic impacts throughout the world as well. So it's not just a matter of uh, personal well-being, but it really has to do with you know, the threat to the well-being of the world. And if you think I'm um, exaggerating, I'm going to give you a fact that will be hard to hear, but I would like you to, um, to know this, that we are deeply concerned about war throughout the world. And each year about a half a million people die in combat in war throughout the world. So what I want to tell you is twice that number. A million people end their own lives from suicide each year. And so it's catastrophic. It's very serious. Um, it affects all of us. And so I really want to say that it's important that we all um, understand this. And I don't want to be negative, but I do want to say that this is a big part of what we're dealing with in our world. And if you look specifically at the Palo Alto neighborhoods, we're dealing with dealing with this issue all the time. So our goal today is really to think about the aspirational, positive, the most you can do in terms of joy and purpose in your life, but also to accept the fact and recognize the fact that there's part of it that relates to a darker issue that we deal with um, as part of the human condition. So um, let me uh, thank you for being here, and um, I hope that you'll um, bring your questions to us. And um, I wanted to introduce Steve Adelsheim you've heard uh, is a child and adolescent psychiatrist as well as an adult psychiatrist. And um, he'll be talking with us a little bit about um, how to recognize um, health, well-being, and maybe what are uh, worrisome problems in young people. Uh, Thank you, Laura. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> yeah. So good morning, everybody. And yeah. I want to second uh, Laura in thanking you all for being here to join us for this important discussion. And, uh, you know, I want to begin um, as Laura says, by talking about um, some of these issues from the perspective from childhood really into young adulthood. As Laura said, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. More importantly, I am the father of four girls, if you can imagine. And so I've learned quite a lot about sort of mental health related issues as a, as a parent over time and my daughters range from 27 to 13. So it's been an interesting journey to this point as well. And one of the things I will tell you, as Laura is sort of referring, is one of the big issues around getting mental health support is actually the issue of stigma. And so one of the things I want to share with you is the fact that within my family, within every generation that I am aware of, we have at least one family member who has a mental illness and has been involved in treatment through my life. And I think it's important to talk about that because when we actually look at mental health issues, one of the things that people may not realize is half of all mental health conditions have their onset by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24 years of age. So what that means is that it's very important for us to recognize early warning signs of serious mental illness and to get care early and to understand that supporting our children and families means learning these early warning signs. So let me share a couple of those with you so you can be just thinking about that. You know, lots of times parents ask me, well, how do I know if it's just teenage stuff or if the issue that we're dealing with really is something more serious? And so what I like to think about is sort of functional kinds of issues with my young person to sort of recognize if there's really something serious going on or not. So an example might be if my child is really starting to spend more time isolated from their friends if there's starting to be changes in how they take care of themselves or less concern about their appearance. Even sleep is a very important predictor of change in terms of mental health kinds of conditions. Young people will talk about having more interrupted sleep, not sleeping well, or even not feeling tired at all and staying up through the night can be a very important issue to consider and address in terms of looking at what might be some early concerns for young people in terms of their care. So looking at those issues, our grades dropping, our interactions with friends changing are all very important things. And the reason that this really matters also is because we have more and more evidence that early intervention really makes a difference. Whether we're talking about dealing with the issues of life stress and dealing with a loss within a family situation, 
all the way to the issues of um, a serious mental illness like schizophrenia, which is the population that I spend a lot of time working with, we realize now that understanding those early warning signs is very important. And when we can wrap support and services around young people very quickly, it really seems to make a big difference. And when we're providing those services, the kinds of things we actually start to do in terms of support when we're looking at a continuum intervention are frankly very similar to the things that we wanna do when we take care of ourselves. We wanna manage stress. And as Laura says, being in this community, and I'm someone who really has moved here 10 months ago, and it is incredibly beautiful, and it is a very high powered and at times very stressful environment. And so I see people learning to manage stress, and some people continuing to struggle with it. So when I'm working with young people, we talk about exercise. We talk about spiritual religious practice and being part of a community of support that will really allow people to not feel isolated. Many people in this community are involved in meditation or yoga or other types of stress management supports and those continue to be very, very important for self-management. We now know that eating dinner together as a family is one of the most important things that young children can experience to be successful and do well as they continue to grow and thrive over time. So building those stress supports are very important. When we're looking at more intensive treatment, we're also looking at stress management. A lot of our individual therapy revolves around individual talking support with young people to help manage anxiety and stress. Family support revolves around improving family communication and dealing with stress levels. Sometimes when young people are facing a mental health issue, we need to recommend lowering expectations academically, job-wise, for a short term to sort of get over the hump of that difficult issue and then be able to get back on track after that. So all of those are very important components, not only for general health, but they're the first part of interventions for mental health. So when we look at the kind of programs in, in our department that are, that are working in this direction, we want to provide care where the kids are. So school mental health has been a very important part of our department's work and helping support the school districts and finding young people who have early mental health issues and linking them to care. We are even training young people to recognize early warning signs so they can take a, a friend in need to a trusted adult to get other kinds of support. In our eating disorders program, finding those issues early, linking young people and their families to early support is also critical. And now in the work that I've been involved with is really around young people that may wonder if they're starting to have a serious mental illness developing. Are they starting to hear voices? Are those people whispering about them in, in the other part of the hallway at school? But recognizing those early warning signs and then linking young people to service early and treatment really is critical. So, you know, what I just wanna close with is managing stress is important for all of us. Recognizing early warning signs really matters. And the other really important point is that treatment works. And we need to break through those stigma issues and ensure that we and our families are getting care right away, or at least checking when we start to have concerns. So I'll stop Yes, there. thank you, Steve. And, yes, and, and, and Anna Lemke. So I'm just gonna take um, about five minutes to talk about addiction. And um, there's a lot to say. So I'm gonna focus on how we transition or how people who become addicted to substances transition from experimental or recreational use to addiction. The good news is that most young people who experiment with drugs and alcohol do not go on to become addicted to drugs and alcohol. However, most adult addicts did start using in their teens. So it is a time when the early, um, the early kind of coping strategies and habits and behaviors that an addict will um, engage in later do begin in adolescence. Um, so how does that look? How does recreational use become um, abusive and addictive use? Um, first of all, there's that positive reinforcement. So a young person tries drugs and or alcohol and experiences a very positive sensation. We sometimes refer to that as being high, but it's not for every person a kind of euphoric high. It can just be escaping from their body 
feeling more relaxed. Perhaps alcohol and drugs for them solves some problem. It helps them socialize with others. It helps them study and focus. It helps them fall asleep. But the key ingredient is that it's positively reinforcing. And I will have many of my addicted patients over the years tell me that they knew from that first sip of alcohol that they were in trouble. So what then happens? How does that progress? Well, very often what happens to the young adolescent is that they'll then affiliate with other people who are using drugs and alcohol. That's a way to normalize their behavior, particularly if they're using more frequently. As long as they're hanging out with other young people who are using frequently, they can tell themselves, hey, everybody's doing it, no problem. I see lots of Stanford students who say, everybody gets drunk on Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. And I'll have to inform them that's not actually true. You know, the data show that you're in this tiny sliver of one percentile based on the amount of alcohol that you're consuming. The other thing that we've learned a lot more about in recent decades is the neurobiology of addiction and what that habitual use of drugs and alcohol does to the brain. The first thing that it does is it can change the hedonic set point. So the hedonic set point is a way of talking about how we experience pleasure, what makes me happy, what behaviors feed into my dopamine reward pathway. Dopamine's a neurotransmitter which is in my reward pathway and gives me that up, uh, that sense of feeling good. Seeing a friend, watching a sunset, eating a good piece of chocolate cake. What happens when people use drugs and alcohol habitually is that they experience brain changes such that those natural rewards are no longer rewarding. And the reason for that is because the extracellular dopamine release that drugs of abuse cause inside our brain are so much more rewarding than natural rewards that, that the natural rewards just pale in comparison. So you've got that initial positive reinforcement. You've got that change in the hedonic set point with habitual use where natural rewards are no longer as rewarding. And then if that use becomes daily, then you really have very significant brain changes that go on where the individual can develop tolerance and withdrawal. Tolerance means they need more of that substance to get the same response. Withdrawal means that when they stop using it, they experience a lot of physiologic consequences and psychological consequences such that they feel they need to use again just to feel okay. That's called negative re reinforcement, where I use a substance just to make myself not feel bad. And that's a very common progression that we see in this pathway to addiction. In terms of the behavioral phenomenon that occurs in, in, on this pathway to addiction, a lot of people who struggle with addiction will engage in what we call denial. That means they're lying to other people about their use, but most importantly, they're lying to themselves about whether or not it's problematic. A patient of mine defined denial in a wonderful way. She said, denial means don't even know I am lying, which is really true. One of the hallmarks of developing addiction is actually kind of a compulsive lying. It starts with lying about use, but then it becomes lying about what you did last night, lying about what you had for breakfast. Lying becomes a way of life. There's sort of sometimes a double life that addicts engage in. They have their regular life where they're engaging in their job productively. Um, relationships are going okay, but then here on the side they have this kind of dark secret that nobody else knows about until of course it explodes out into their real lives. And then that really does get us to how we clinically define addiction. And we define it by talking about the three C's. The first C is compulsive use. What does compulsive use mean? It means a whole lot of mental real estate begins to be devoted to thinking about the drug, using the drug, and recovering from the drug. So I, as a physician, may be able to get through my clinical day, but really all day long, all I'm waiting for is the end of the day so I can get home and have a drink or whatever my drug of choice is. Um, the second C is control. And what we see with addiction is out of control use. So I'm planning to go home and just have two. Tonight it really will just be two. And guess what, after two I have three, I have four, I have 10 until I'm passed out and I do that night and night and night again, even though that was not my plan. Finally, and this to me is really the hallmark of severe addiction, continued use despite consequences. So all of a sudden, this behavior of mine, which was just recreational, 
and then progressed to maybe a bad habit is now so out of control that I've got trouble with my spouse, I've got trouble at work, and yet despite, maybe I even have a DUI, despite those really significant consequences and the huge negative impact on my life, I can't stop. I continue to use, and that is really what I see in, in, my, in my clinic um, and what, what Aristotle called the clear-eyed incontinent. Someone who recognizes that their behavior is wrong, they don't want to engage in that behavior, and they choose to stop that behavior, and yet, despite all that, they continue to do it. And this is why we talk about, in the addiction field, the hijacked brain. This idea that, it, that the choice really, the individual really has, at some point in their addiction, lost the ability to choose for themselves because their brain has been hijacked by the substance. Let me just end by saying, just like Stephen did, the good news, the really good news, is that treatment for addiction works. A lot of people are very pessimistic about treatment for addiction. They have this false notion that it doesn't work. Actually, it works about 50% of the time in all comers, which, by the way, is on par with our treatment for depression. So people think depression's hopeless, but addiction treatment's hopeless, but depression treatment, you know, there's lots of stuff. The truth is there's lots of good treatment for addiction if we can get people to overcome the stigma, get them access to good health care and good addiction treatment, get them to engage in treatment, people get better. Thanks. And Dr. Keith Humphreys. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk about health insurance. And I'm going to start by telling you a story. Um, on Saturday, my two little boys were climbing in a tree. So I hopped up there to give them expert advice and parental supervision. I broke my wrist here, here, and here. Um, they're fine. They thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> I went to PAMF. I got splinted. I got casted in this beautiful purple thing that matches my shirt. Um, but, you know, so that hurt, but at no point did the thought enter my mind, I hope my health insurance covers a broken bone. Of course it covers a broken bone. I mean, from the beginning of health insurance 100 years ago, that was the pluperfect condition for health insurance, trauma, right? But over that same period, you would not be that sure if you had a mental illness or an addiction. And if there could be an experience more traumatic than, say, having a, a psychiatrist tell you that your teenage child is showing a first psychotic break and a, a sign potential of schizophrenia, it would be then going home and opening up the insurance book from your employer and looking in the mental health section where you've never looked before and discovering there's no coverage or there's very minimal coverage. And so now not only do you have to deal with this illness, you may have to deal with bankruptcy or substandard care. So what I want to tell you about, this is all good news, is that this picture has gotten much, much better in just the last few years. And it's going to tell you about three huge changes to how we uh, cover uh, mental health care in the United States. And I'm going to tell you this for two reasons. One, to give you some sense of why we have a mental health policy section in the psychiatry department, why we work directly with legislators at the state and the federal level to try to make uh, uh, you know, a better set of rules for families facing this issue. But also for you, if you are in a situation where you or a loved one are seeking mental health care or have been getting it and are, are, are need further care, uh, it's a really good time to look at your benefits because they may have gotten better. So let me tell you what the three big changes are. First one is Medicare. Medicare covers about 50 million people, mostly seniors, but also people who are disabled. From the very beginning, Medicare on outpatient care covered 80% of everything except mental health which it only covered half. And that reflected the view that this, these aren't really illnesses and the care for them isn't real care. So that discriminatory treatment was overturned in a law that passed in 2008 and it was phased in so that as of January 1st of this year, just five months ago, the outpatient benefit for Medicare is the same as everything else, it covers 80%. So if you are on Medicare level into Medicare, your, health, your outpatient mental health insurance just got a lot better. Second big change, another law also passed in 2008, is called parity. And this refers to insurance that people get through companies, big companies, which is 100 million people get their insurance that way in the United States. Historically, it used to be legal for a company to say, our policy covers 60 days in the hospital a year, unless it's mental health, in which case it covers 30 days. Or our outpatient uh, copay is $10, unless it's mental health, then it's $25. 
That is now all illegal after the passage of parity. Any benefits a big employer offers for mental health or for addiction have to be as good as the benefits they offer for everything else. The last change is the Affordable Care Act, and there's two very important parts of it for mental health. First one is that uh, depending on how old your kids are, you will remember that your, your kids had to leave your, your family's insurance when they were 18, or if they were in college, they could stay until they were 21 or 22. The Affordable Care Act lets parents keep kids on their insurance until the age of 26. And this matters for the reason that, that Stephen said, is that almost all mental illnesses and addiction are evident by that age. So extending out over that vulnerable period, more insurance coverage for like, you know, a classic example would be a, a young person who is a graduate student, they're off mom and dad's insurance, they have kind of junky insurance through the university, and then they have a, a psychotic episode, or they develop an addiction, and they're, they're just, the net's not there for them. So that's important, extending it up to age 26. The other change is that the law defines mental health care as essential to health. Not a hood ornament on the car, but a critical piece of the engine of health. So what that means is, on the exchanges, California covered, if you buy an individual uh, insurance or your small employer buys one through there, or you're covered by the expanded Medicaid that has been rolled out, you have benefits for mental health and addiction. Plans are required to offer them. And that covers about 60 million people. So about 50 million people on Medicare, at least 100 million through the parity law, 60 million through the Affordable Care Act. There's some overlap between those, but the the, the the end result is, and this is all you have to know, you don't need to memorize all of these laws or everything, but just for you personally, if you haven't looked at what you're covered for in the last year even, look again. There's a really good chance that you're in better shape than you were and be able to get better access to care and not have to worry about uh, going broke while you do it. Thanks. Thank you. So my, my colleagues and I have the privilege of serving in a department of psychiatry that is one of the very finest in, in the country. Actually, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. And we do everything from mindfulness training in the schools to help young people who are dealing with adversity at home to mindfulness training for elders that are taught through our department to basic science that's studying the brain, the mechanisms of the brain, some of which Anna referred to, to public policy and, and work throughout the world. So we're ready for any question you might bring to us based on that breadth um, related to uh, well-being, resilience, mental health, and any concerns you might have. Questions? Mindfulness training. Somebody help me. Yep. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, so, so, you know, mindfulness, mindfulness is sort of the buzzword of the last decade or so. But w what it refers to is a way of narrowing consciousness in order to, um, as a technique, to get relief from emotionally being dysregulated. And so, so it's kind of like a meditation technique that we're, you know, stealing in a way or co-opting from centuries of thought. But what you do in mindfulness is you narrow your consciousness down to your simple breath, um, becoming aware of your body and its position in that moment, um, becoming aware of what you're hearing. Um, I hear sort of a little bit of a gurgling back behind me. Um, other than that, I'm not hearing very much. So it's a, it's a way of focusing on sensation, reintegrating the mind and the body, narrowing consciousness as a way to re-regulate yourself emotionally when you're feeling dysregulated. So, you know, traditionally, uh, psychoanalysis was focused on going back to early family of origin and tracing back to some early trauma and then attributing that as uh, the source of your uh, problems and then trying to figure out, you know, what had happened and, and to explain your current issues. What we do a lot more of now, although we still do that, is really looking at the here and now and learning skills, so teaching people skills. Like, I'm in the plane and it's rattling around, that's my particular, um, you know, anxiety thing. I'm in the back and it's going and I'm thinking, I'm having all kinds of catastrophizing thoughts. If I've been trained in mindfulness, I can Hopefully, I've, I've tried it. I'm variably uh, successful with the, you know, focus on my breath, narrow my consciousness, calm myself down. 
Um, Dr. Edersham, you had mentioned the importance of addressing stigma. And in a community in Palo Alto where it's very diverse and there's a lot of different cultures, some of which have um, attitudes towards mental illness that might make it very difficult to recognize and therefore get treatment for. And I'm wondering what are some of your thoughts around addressing that? Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Thank so, you. So I know that um, as, I, as I've been involved in this work, I, I've really come to accept the fact that stigma is just a huge issue for all of us in the work that we do. And when I mentioned uh, the fact of very young people, you know, the onset of mental illness, the other fact is that 80% of those who might have a mental health condition actually never access care. It's a, it's a huge number. Four out of five never get to treatment. Right. There certainly have been insurance issues. There's a workforce issue in terms of providers, but access um, and stigma have just been huge components of this. I think when we're looking at this issue across different cultural groups, what seems very important is to be able to find uh, members within each community that are willing to often take the lead in talking within that community about these issues and looking at ways to address them. We've been looking, as, as you know, at actually um, some media-related kinds of activities as well, that we could sort of be reaching out to the community in a broader way, having people speak about their own experiences and success with getting care, but doing that within the context of culturally appropriate groups here at Stanford, actually, within the context of the student health programs right now, um, there are different groups that are focused on supporting different cultural groups and ethnic groups within the context of the university. So right now, the student health program has particular people that are meeting with um, the Asian American community in the school, with the Native American group at the school, with the black community at the school, and having particular support networks really for different cultural groups and ethnic groups to find ways to uh, support that communication directly within that frame. And, and so uh, my sense is that really building that support, I think building facts, and then within each culture group having individuals with the courage to reach out and do that is very important and I think we're very interested in being of support to anyone that's interested in doing that within their community. Thank you and may I also comment on a couple things. Um, what doesn't work to combat stigma is to go around scolding and saying, you know, stigma's bad, stigma's wrong. What does work is um, a few things we know from the social science literature. One is people of courage who will speak up about their experiences and kind of normalize the experience just a little bit. It is across the human condition that we, we experience some mental health issues or distress when facing certain life um, stressors like um, loss of a friend, loss of a parent, uh, divorce, things like that. These are normal responses. So normalizing the distress and the response and seeing ways to address it. So opinion leaders who will take, who will courageously talk about it. The other thing is um, recognizing the biological components to certain uh, responses, mental, mental um, health responses that are problematic. Um, if you recognize that there's a biological contributor to it across different cultures, there's more um, acceptance of the problem. So if you are in dialogue with someone who's talking about their child or the problem or whatever, just accepting that there might be a biological piece to it, normalizing it, you know, re making reference to other people who've dealt with this. That's why I'm so proud of many celebrities for coming out about their experiences because the courage that they're showing in doing that um, is really phenomenal. So I think those are the different kinds of, of things that you can kind of work on. Um, but if those things fail, um, helping a person who you see as perhaps in distress, reaching out to them, talking with them, and helping them get confidential care. Um, and we can help with that. Um, last thing I would say, and I think about this a lot at Stanford, and uh, Steve has four daughters. I have five daughters and one son, so I run to work because I want to get out of the house. There's five of them are teenagers. But is, um, is the idea of don't be perfect, be awesome. Um, I think uh, I've been so struck how in this Bay Area, you know, I'm from the Midwest. We're straightforward. We never expect to be perfect. We're a bunch of idiots. In this area here, there is this extraordinary expectation of being perfect. 
in every aspect of your life. And um, the language I've been trying to introduce to the Stanford campus is everyone's here because they're awesome in some way, but you do not have the obligation to be perfect in order to be at Stanford, to be in the Bay Area. So even uh, across every culture, I think this idea of being extraordinary, being wonderful, being awesome, but not necessarily having to be perfect, I think is another thing, another kind of um, approach we can all take across cultures. So hi, my question is um, based on uh, the first session I was in, which was the genomic uh -huh. work that's going on here at Stanford. Right. And I'm wondering if you could talk about genetics and is there a link across generations and genetics uh, for mental health issues? And then related to the genomic work to try to identify a propensity or genetic tendency towards this or that disease. Yeah. Have you used any of those techniques here to try to identify the propensity to mm -hmm. experience some kind of mental health issue and then to proactively treat it either with medicines or with some kind of behavioral treatments? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll comment and then I'll invite you all to comment. Um, absolutely, we're working on this. The, the issue that is, challenging in mental health, mental illness, disease, neuropsychiatric diseases, is, um, is that we, there isn't a single gene that causes a condition. Um, we have our disorders are what are referred to as complex disorders. So you might have a biological propensity, you might have a biological vulnerability, and then you might have some, a certain kind of experience that causes that propensity to be expressed. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is resilience um, itself has a genetics to it. And we all know this intuitively. We know our friends who just bounce back like that, and we know other people where one hit and they're just down. It really, really hits them hard. And we are beginning to understand the biological determinants of that. The other thing we know is that no matter how resilient you are, if you have repeated trauma, there will be a certain point where it will be too much, it will be too much. All of these things appear to have genetic components to them. So um, in our department, we have a number of uh, projects related to genetics trying to, for example, figure out the causes or correlates of schizophrenia, um, looking at intellectual disabilities and looking at the genetic origins of intellectual disabilities. Um, but we're also looking at kind of the more, the brighter side of it, which is what would be the biological or genetic contrib contributions to building resilience, people who live a very optimal life, how do you push back um, the expression of symptoms symptoms um, in a person who does have that biological vulnerability. So I think it's always uh, glass half full. Um, there are very few conditions in our field that we take care of where if you have a gene, you're going to get a disease. Therefore, the way we hear that is there are so many things that we can do. If we recognize it early, we can help support people, have them have the best possible life, even if they have a genetic vulnerability. But if you'd like to follow up on any specifics or whatever, I'd be happy to connect you with members of our faculty who are working in different areas. I have a follow-up to that and, yes. and also <clears throat> related to the um, uh, Professor Lemke's discussion about how, how the brain changes with addiction. Yeah. Is there <clears throat> some sort of um, point where, I guess, a trauma um, brings out a, a predisposition, whether it's depression or mm -hmm. schizophrenia or any of these where once you've had an, an event or an experience like that, um, does the brain change and it becomes easier to experience it again under you know, similar stress? Mm -hmm. And you know, does age relate to that or does catching it and treating it you know, help? Prevent it, yeah. Um, well, let me, uh, let me first speak to the issue of uh, genetics and prevention. Addiction is one of the most heritable mental illnesses that we have. 50 to 70% of the risk for, for becoming addicted is related to genes alone, far surpassing, for example, the 30% risk um, in depression. And, and that's, that's, a commonly, um, that's not commonly known about addiction. 
There have been prospective studies following sons of alcoholics, finding that 50% of sons of alcoholics will go on to have an alcohol use problem, even if raised outside of the alcoholic home. If you have a parent or a grandparent with addiction, you're at four times the risk of developing addiction. And because of that, there is now some thought uh, within the medical community that perhaps we should be targeting young people differently. So if you have a young person and you kind of screen them for recreational use and it just sounds like pretty innocent recreational use, you might treat that differently than if you had the same sorts of behaviors in someone who had a parent or a grandparent who was addicted. And there is this, this idea now that we really should be advising people differently based on their risk. I think, I think your question is not directly related to addiction. I think your question is related to this phenomenon of can you have some kind of mental health problem that then sort of kindles the brain for more problems? Is that, is that your question? Yeah. Okay. And there is this kindling hypothesis uh, that does, uh, based on the fact that the more, for example, in bipolar disorder, the more number of episodes that people have, the more likely they are to have a more severe course and to have more episodes. And the idea being that somehow the brain with each episode is kindled the way a fire is kindled for more episodes. And that's really purely hypothetical at this point as far as I know. It's based on the epilepsy or the seizure data where we know is once someone has had a seizure, then their seizure threshold is much lower. They're much, it's much easier to stimulate a seizure in them once they've had a seizure. So perhaps um, you know, that, that answers your question. Um, right here. Uh, my question is with regard to public health and uh, I was actually going to phrase it in the context of addiction and borderline because they both have a characteristic component in that they can be passed down through generations. Um, and I don't know the degree to which borderline is uh, uh, an inheritable trait as opposed to seems to be uh, an easily manufactured trait. And um, uh, I, within family, I have experience with both. Uh, and so as an issue of public health, the way in which these diseases are able to replicate through generations seems to be very significant, costly in terms of human lives, money, everything. And I, I just don't know how, um, uh, how psychiatry, how mental health really contemplates this as a public health issue. To just speak briefly to the co-occurrence, so um, it is true that if you have a mental illness, you're at higher risk for developing addiction, especially bipolar disorder, ADHD, borderline personality disorder. So, and the, the relationship between those two, why it is that um, folks who have mental illness are at higher risk for addiction, and folks with addiction at higher risk for mental illness is, is complex, but, but it is very true that these things co-occur. In terms of the public health issue, did you want to? This is one place where this touches health policy. This is why it's so important to change that you can't be denied insurance um, based on the pre-existing condition. I mean, what, I mean, we all lie to our doctors to some extent. And, you know, and if one was going to lie with some particularly, I, you know, would you say, you know, I have a long genetic history of borderline disorder in, in my family? Um, if you, where does that go? Does it go in the medical record at some point as a later employer or insurer going to say, you know, we'd really rather not cover you. And so that, so from a, you know, that, that's where they sort of come together is the fact that that can't happen to us anymore. And I suspect that means we'll probably learn about this a lot more because lots of people have not been being candid for the very good reason that they could suffer for being candid. But to also underscore your point about how it's a significant threat to the public health, I mean, we, we see that by 2020 throughout the world, mental illness will be the greatest uh, disease burden area. It, we will have had so much progress in many different areas, but it will have overcome, say, HIV and infectious disease as the major cause of disability throughout the world. So you are really focusing on the severity of these illnesses and the disability that come with it really is a major threat to the public health throughout the world. We Thank you for We have time for just one more question, but after this session is over, our speakers will be around. Yeah, I'm happy to talk with you further. Yes, I've worked 34 years with adolescent eating disorder at 
Packard and mm -hmm. Children's Hospital at Stanford before that. Thank you. And it is a big passion of mine. And so what I have seen that we've really been able to go forward and really uh, treat differently today than we did. Mm -hmm. But I'm also, I have a sadness of not reaching everyone and getting early screening, early treatment for the same reason you said, or for the exact same reason that the outcomes are so much better. And it's great sadness that I see disproportionately young women, young girls who are affected and also our young men and how can we have a campaign, so uh, you know, public health campaign that will have a larger net to capture early treatment, take away the stigma, because it gets so minimized today mm -hmm. as it grows. Yeah, no, we. I think we would all just really agree and and underscore that point. Great. Well, thank you very much for giving us part of your Saturday, and we'll be here and would love to talk with you further. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.